a place for people. People that need help, and that's all of us at one time or another. We need different kinds of help, maybe. God Tell is not primarily a place to give people a roof over their head and food to eat. God Tell is a place whereby we can tell people about Jesus Christ. God Tell is a school. It's my school. It's my wife's school. It's a place whereby we can learn how to minister to people, how to love people, sometimes people that are unlovable. And all the people that cooperate in this effort get to be part of what's going on in God Tell. Can I go home now? <laughs> I got to shift gears. It's hard. When I used to pastor churches, I had a music director. And when I was a music director in churches, I had a pastor. Now I got to do both. We traveled all over the country doing revival meetings and concerts, and it got to where a lot of the churches who used to have a pastor or an evangelist and a music director come in, when they found out we could do both, they just let us do both of them. It was very interesting. I'm not in the book of Isaiah, so I don't know why I'm there. There's where I am. I'm just killing time until I catch my breath. We just uh, finished a new album. I got a call from a guy in Georgia. He got a copy of our new album and called me up to thank me for it. That was pretty cool. I've never had that happen before. Usually people won't even walk across the street to talk to me. <laughs> they call me from Georgia. The guy that used to work for us 40-something years ago. We are in Hebrews chapter 2. Now some of you are new, so I have to show you my sign. Y'all know what to do there, and then you know what to do there, right? Some of you don't look so good. Maybe you had a hard day. I doubt it. Most of you don't know what hard is yet. Wait till you get my age. People ask me how I'm doing. I say 71. And what? I asked you how you were doing. I said, yeah, that's right, 71. I said, look, man, I can either tell you my age or I can tell you all my aches and pains. Which would you prefer? I'd rather hear your age always tell me. I'm getting old. This title, if you're taking notes, is Christ Made Like Unto His Brethren. Paul spent a lot of time, some of you weren't here to hear it, but a lot of time in the first chapter proving from Scripture that Jesus is God. Not one God among many gods, not a God like the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons teach, but the only God, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the first and the last He's the only God, but he has three distinct personalities, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we're going to discuss that a little more because you guys have three, at least three persons. Some of you have four or five, you know, so it shouldn't bother you much that God has three. Starting in verse 2, therefore, because of what he taught in those previous chapters about angels being ministers to the Christians and about how that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself and creating everything. Therefore, and you should always ask yourself this question when you see the word therefore in the Bible, wherefore the therefore or what's the therefore therefore? And then you can usually figure out it's about something that went before. Therefore we ought to give more earnest heed to the things which we have heard lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. For unto the angels has he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that you visited him? 
You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and did set him over the work of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, and he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. So let's go back to verse 1 and see what we can learn. We ought to give more earnest heed. That means pay serious attention to the things that we've heard. You know, most of us have heard the gospel message at one time or another, but most people don't pay too much attention to it. It kind of goes in one ear and out the other. We are supposed to pay serious attention so that we don't let it slip. The word slip there means to forget. If you're not careful, you will hear the truth, but you don't pay attention to it, so you forget the truth. And then come judgment day, you'll be answerable for the truth, but you won't know what the truth is. But God will hold you accountable anyway. There are no excuses when we get to the judgment seat of Christ. You have been given by God a tremendous gift, a whole lifetime to discover the truth. And most people just aren't interested. Jesus said this, The way that leads to destruction, hell, is broad, and many will find that road. They're going to find it. The way that leads to life is very narrow, and very few will find that. But most people just don't care. They care about today. They care about, you know, what they're going to eat, what they're going to drink, how they're going to have fun, party, party, party. But they're not really concerned about eternal life. But judgment day comes, you will be. But then it's too late. He gave you this life to get it right. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, that means sure, set, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, that means you've got to pay. The wages of sin, Romans 3 says, is death. The Old Testament, the law of sin is death death. You don't have anything that you can offer God to get off the hook except your life. And you can't get off the hook if you don't trust Jesus. What are you going to do on judgment? Are you going to stand before God and God's going to say, it's time to pay up, man. You rejected my my salvation. You're not going to get salvation. You got to pay for it now. What do you want to pay with? And you're going to look around in your pocket, man, and come out with some money and So I got some money. God said, I don't need your money. I paved my streets with gold. What am I going to do with your money? And he said, well, but Lord, I have a talent. I can sing. And the Lord's going to say, I got angels to sing better than you. I said, well, Lord, I'm smart. And the Lord's going to look at me and say, but my little finger has more intelligence than your whole head. You know, what are you going to offer God to keep you out of hell? Well, you don't have anything. You don't have one thing you can offer God that he needs. God needs nothing. He already owns it all. He doesn't need us. Thank God he loves us, but he don't need us. The only thing you have to offer is your life. And if you don't receive Christ and trust him as your Lord and Savior, you will spend eternity dying. See, hell is not a joking place. And it's not something to take lightly. It's not, well, I'm going to just die and be annihilated. You are going to die, and you're going to die, and you're going to die, and you're going to keep dying, but you will never be able to cease to exist. That's why it's called eternal death. And Jesus himself will be tormenting you while you're calling on his name, bending your knee and trying to, it won't do you a bit of good. He won't pay any attention to you. You have this opportunity. Why do you think you're here? Most of you don't get it. You think you got here by bad luck. There's no such thing. Everybody in this room and on our other missions is there because God put you there so you'd have one more opportunity. 
and you don't take advantage of it and you decide to leave here just as empty as you came in, on judgment day, you're going to have nobody to blame but yourself. And I believe God's got this big screen. He's going to pull it down and then play back all the times you heard the gospel. Now you won't have an excuse, not one. <clears throat> so if you have to pay up, he says, don't you think you ought to pay attention because we cannot escape there's no escape if we neglect so great a salvation. There's no way out. You say, well, I don't believe all that. That's fine. I've had people tell me, oh, I'm going to hell with all my friends. Like, That's fine. Go ahead, go. You won't like it when you get there, and you'll find out right away you don't have any friends. You know, most people think they got friends, but wait till some trouble comes and see how many friends. And I learned this lesson when I was about 16. I, was, I went to Whittier High School in, in California. It's about 16 miles out of Los Angeles. And um, I was, we had 3,000 kids in that school, and I was one of the few with a car. I had a 1950 Ford convertible with no top. Of course, if you listen to the Beach Boys, you know that it never rains in Southern California. And I, man, my buddies would come along, they'd pile in my car, and, and back in those days, we could cruise the school, it was a big school, but we could go all the way around it, you know, cruise school, wave it to girls, you know, I mean, we were something, we had a car, man, I had a car. My dad told me one day when I was leaving to go somewhere, he says, where are you going, son? I said, I'm going to go pick up my friends, and we're going to go, and I told him where we are going to go, show or something, we had driving movies back in those days, lots of fun. They've taken all the fun out of life since I grew up. And my dad looked at me and he said something I have never forgotten. He said, son, just wait till your car breaks down and see how many friends you've got. Ah, you old dumb man, you don't know anything. I, we used to really get into it. Sometimes we had fights. I mean, but you know what? There came a day when my car was broke down. And folks, I couldn't find a friend with a search warrant My dad was right. I didn't know he was that smart, but he was right. Finally, after about a week or so, I had to walk to school for about a week. I finally got my car going again, got it fixed. Man, all my friends came out of the woodwork, piling back into the car. Let's go, let's go. And we used to go every Saturday and Sunday, we'd go to the beach. You know, we lived a lot of those songs that the Beach Boys sang. That's why I like them so much. We lived a lot of stuff like they had in Happy Days. We had those restaurants just like that and the old cars and all that stuff, you know. And darn, I had to get old. Now nobody's got anything but computerized junk. <clears throat> if you do not trust Jesus, how are you going to escape the judgment that's coming? Well, you can't. There's no escape. There's no way around it. What are you going to do? Get on your knees and beg God? He's the one that's going to sentence you to hell, and he's the one that's going to be tormenting you while you're in there. You know, if you read the Bible, you'll find out something fascinating. In the book of Revelations, Jesus is tormenting the people day and night. And if you read when Jesus was uh, here on earth, and uh, he went over to heal some people that were demon-possessed, and the demon said, are you here to torment us before the time? They knew it. You know why? Because God is the only one that has not only the ability, but the right to torment anybody. I don't have that right. I can aggravate people, but I don't, can't really torment people. I like to use the word torment because it sounds so good. I told somebody one time, that I, in fact, my wife did. She was talking to some ladies at church, and they asked her, they said, Does Brother June have a spiritual gift? And she said, Oh, yes, he does. And they said, what is it? She said, it's the gift of aggravation. <laughs> oh, Lord, here we go. Oh. <laughs> gift of aggravation. I thought that was pretty cool. But I am an equal opportunity aggravator because I found out the only way to find out what's in a lemon is to squeeze it. Think about that. So if I want to find out what's inside you, what's in your heart, because that'll come out of your mouth. If I put a little pressure on you, I'll find out exactly what's down in there. 
If I just listen to you most of the time, I can know what's in your heart. Because what you love the most is what you're going to speak about the most. If you really love Jesus, that's what you're going to talk about. If you love football more than anything, guess what you'll talk about? I've got some friends that that's all they talk about is sports. I know what's in their heart. I sit there, you know, every, I meet with them every Monday. We sit around and visit. We've known each other forever. And uh, a lot of times I finally have to just say, well, guys, I got to go. I'll see you all later because I get tired of listening to all the stuff about football and, and baseball and basketball. And one guy loves golf. That's got to be, to me, the most boring sport I've ever heard of. How are you going to escape if you neglect? I mean, you've got a book. Everything you need to know for life and godliness is in this book. Everything you need to know about how to raise your children, it's in this book. Everything you need to know about your, your work ethic, it's in this book. Everything you need to know about how to treat a husband or a wife, it's in this book. And the reason we've got the mess we got in America is because most people aren't paying attention to it. They think they know better. We've got a, uh, you know, family members who raise their children differently. It's a new generation, you know. They don't believe in spanking and stuff like that. They are not taking God seriously, and one day they're going to regret it. That's why I don't want to hang around here and see how my 13 grandchildren are going to turn out. I'm afraid I'll be disappointed. I've already been disappointed with some of them. I got grandchildren that are already 30 years old. And I've been somewhat disappointed. I just want to get out of here. I pray every day, God kill me. Get me out of here. My wife says, I'm in agreement with that, Lord. Take him away. <laughs> this word was first spoken of by our Lord. Does anybody know where the first word about salvation was spoken in the Bible? Go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. Right after Eve, that wicked woman, she went over and took a bite out of the golden avocado because y'all didn't know it was a golden avocado. You thought it was an apple, but it doesn't say that in the Bible. So I got as much for a golden avocado as you got for an apple. And since it's my story, it's a golden avocado. And the devil tricked her and she went over and bit that fruit because he told her that if she ate that fruit, she would become a god. That's been going on for a long time. The Mormons still believe that. They think they're going to become gods. Not going to happen. Anyway, she sinned. <clears throat> and then she told her husband, look, I ate the fruit and I didn't drop dead. And he looked over at her and I know what went through his head. Anything you can do, I can do better. <laughs> so he took a bigger bite. And the dummy, if he would have just said, Lord, hey, the woman that you gave me has sinned. Do something with her. God would have took that blonde out and gave him a brunette. I don't know what color hair she had, but it makes a good story. I, you know, he'd have given him a new wife. I had a guy come up to me one day and says, Brother, what color do you think Adam and Eve were? They lived 6,000 years ago, and I'm supposed to know an answer to that? And one guy said, oh, they had to be white. I said, no. And another guy told me they were black. But I finally, after reading and reading and studying the Word of God, came to the conclusion that they were neither. The people over there in that area are Semites, and uh, they are very dark-skinned. Have you ever seen the Arabs from the original Arabs? You'd know about what they looked like, Possibly. But we don't, we don't put that in stone. It doesn't really make any difference, does it? We all did come. We have a sign right there. You ought to read that sign. God made of one nation. Uh, God made. I can't even read it. Read it. He has made of one blood. There you all go. Nations. All nations of men. Acts 17, 28 or something. Doesn't make any difference. I got news for you. Some of you won't like this, but we're all related I had a genetic test done. I'm 1.5% African American. So I walked into this store where a guy that's black that I've known for a long time, I come in. He says, Brother Jim, what are you doing? I said, man, I got my genetic test back and I found out I'm 1.5% African American and today's the day. <laughs> he just laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed. He thought that was really funny. 
I'm also 11.5% North American Indian, and I got a whole lot of Mexican in me too. You should be able to tell that. I got. I, I'm getting tired of holding my sign up. My arm's getting sore. If I look over the top of my glasses, you should laugh. In Genesis 3 was the first time Jesus spoke about the salvation that was to come. And Jesus himself, the Bible tells us, was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. So when Jesus died on a cross 2,000 years ago, he was just doing what he had already done. And that gets some people upset. How could he do that? He's God. He made everything, as we're going to discuss later, before he made it. Hebrews 4.3. All his works were finished before the foundation of the world. So when God said, let there be light, there was already light, so there could be light when God said, let there be light. Now, if you understand that, you're probably lying. We don't have to understand it. We just have to understand that God said, believe it. And so he was confirmed to those that heard him. That means the witnesses, the apostles. And God also bearing them witness with, get this, signs and wonders and divers, miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost. And we got churches out there trying to duplicate this. It was never meant to be. All God is doing is saying, when the apostles were here on earth, I verified their ministry by these signs and wonders and miracles and all that kind of stuff. Does that mean God doesn't work miracles anymore? No, he's working them right now. He's getting ready to destroy this whole country. It's going down God gave us an opportunity actually he gave us more than one to be a Christian nation and we're not a Christian nation that was, that was something that I told my wife when I heard Obama's speech and I never did care much for anything he said but one thing he said was absolutely the truth he said in the final year of his uh, presidency America is no longer a Christian nation he was right there are some Christians still around, but there's not very many, not real ones. A lot of church members, but that doesn't get you into heaven. It just makes you think you're going there. <clears throat> and these gifts are given to people according to what? His own will. And you know, I've been in churches where people come down the altar and they're begging God that they can speak in tongues, be filled with the Holy Spirit. All this kind of... They got it wrong. The Bible says in Acts 5.32, God gives his spirit to those that obey him. That means God gives you something to do and you do it. And he gives you the spirit of God in order to accomplish that which he wants done. But you don't have to beg God for the spirit of God. You don't have to ask him for it. Just do what he says. And most of what he says that you need to know is in this book. For unto the angels has he not put in subjection of the world to come. Now, he's talking there about 2 Peter chapter 3 where he's going to make the new heaven and the new earth. But he mentions something about angels not being in subjection. We need to understand this. God made man in his image. When Jesus died, he died for people. What color you are is totally irrelevant. He died for you to pay the penalty for your sin. He did not die for angels. Angels can sin, but when they sin, they get kicked out and they get put in prison according to Jude verse 7 and uh, 2 Peter chapter 2. And they stay there until the judgment day when they're cast into the lake of fire. There is no redemption for an angel that sins. Dogs, cats, elephants, and alligators. There's no redemption for them. Jesus did not die for them. He died for people. That's all. And that's why he came to earth as a what? Like a people. But people rejected him. They didn't want him. You know, it's because Jesus didn't look like a superstar or a movie star or a football player. He, didn't have, he wasn't all buffed up, muscled out, you know. He was too ordinary. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah, there was nothing in the appearance of Jesus that would make us desire him. Nothing. In fact, I bet you some people looked over there and said, golly, he's ugly. Yeah. They said, we don't want him. We want somebody that looks cool, man. Somebody like Brother June. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Well, at least I got a laugh without the sign that time. But we don't want him. And then on top of that, he's claiming to be God. They said, we'll show you that crucified him. Not knowing that that was the whole reason he came. <laughs> the devil thought he won. Oh, I got him now, I'll crucify him. But he was supposed to be crucified in order to pay the penalty for our sin. He took our place. You, me, every single person, man, woman, child, should have been on that cross. Man, he did a tremendous thing for you and me. <clears throat> there is in a certain place, this is in Psalms 8, 4, <clears throat> a testimony. What is man that you are mindful? Now, this is where it becomes very interesting because it's a double concept here. What is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you visit him? The man is man, us, the son of man, that's Jesus. You made him, man, us, a little lower than the angels. Right now, angels are more powerful than we are. But it wasn't like that in the beginning, and it won't be like that when Jesus comes back. In fact, the Bible tells us that the Christians are going to judge angels. They are not created in the image of law. They are a, a mono, say it, not a... Not a mono, not a dichotomy, a monochotomy. Monochotomy, there you go. Monochotomy. She's smarter than me, so I have to ask her stuff. And um, they have a spirit, that's it. They have no corporeal form. They don't have bodies like you and I have. Sometimes they appear in a form as a person, but they don't have a real body. Animals, dogs, cats, elephants, giraffes, they're a dichotomy. They have a body, y'all can see their body, and they have a soul. The soul is the mind, the emotions, the will, the intellect. If you don't believe a dog has emotions, just kick him in the stomach. Because he'll either go, oh, crying away, or he'll bite you in the leg. He'll do something. Dogs make decisions. They make better decisions than people sometimes. See, if a dog's going down the street and there's a pole, he has to go to the right or the left or hit it with his nose. If a person comes down the street and there's a pole, they got to go to the right, to the left, or hit it with their nose. I've seen more people hit the poles than dogs. They make decisions. Put hamburger out there and dry food. See which one he goes for. He'll look at them both, but he'll make a decision. And sometimes you look at a dog and any animal, and it looks like they're smiling. Other times you look at them, and it's quite obvious they're not. And you want to get out of there then. But they don't have something we have. We're a triunity or a trichotomy. We have a body. Everybody in here has a body, except the folks sitting in these first three chairs right here. So please don't sit on them. You have a body, and you have a soul, which is the mind, the emotions, the will, the intellect. We have that in common with all animals, but you have something they don't have. You have a spirit. And your spirit is what gives you the capacity to seek God. It's the capacity to know that even when you were little, wondering, you know, why am I here? Where am I going? What's all the purpose of all this stuff? And uh, is there a God? I can remember asking that question of my dad when I was six years old, wanting to know. Of course, by the time we're teenagers, we get talked out of it, you know? So we're a triunity. Well, God is a triunity. And we're created in the image and likeness of God. And one day we're going to be transformed and we will be like our Lord. We won't be God, but we will have a resurrected glorified body like he had after the resurrection. A body that doesn't hunger anymore. A body that doesn't feel pain anymore. And a body that has hair. Should have got a bigger laugh than that. I'm going to have hair. You two guys, you want hair? Get to heaven, you'll have hair. <laughs> you don't think God wants bald people in heaven? Come on. <laughs> oh, gosh. Somebody told me one day that God made some heads perfect and the rest he covered up. <laughs> oh, come on, come on. That's... <laughs> so we are made a little lower than the angels right now, and that's because of sin coming in us into the world. And you'll see that we're talking about Jesus in just, just a minute. 
But man is created a little lower than the angels, and you crowned him with glory and honor and did set him over the work of your hands. When Adam was created and put in the Garden of Eden, he was told to have dominion over this whole planet. The fish in the sea, the birds in the air, all the animals, uh, you know, he was supposed to be in charge of this thing. But he blew it. And he caused us to have to work by the sweat of our brow, which everybody's trying not to do these days. We're supposed to sweat. Everybody's trying to figure out new ways to get around it. Everybody wants an office job, got an air conditioner, you know. I don't. I like to sweat. We, I make my wife sweat. We don't even have an air conditioner in our house. We haven't had an air conditioner for, what, 40 years? About 40 years now. But we're used to it. And, you know, still at my age, I can work outside all day long while I'm watching these young people fall out. They get heat stroke. I just get browner. <laughs> Keep going. <clears throat> so he set us over the work of his hands, and you have put all things in subjection under his feet. But <clears throat> that he put all things under him, he left nothing. Nothing. He put us over this creation and Jesus over us. <clears throat> put under him but now we don't see it that way because we're living in a marred world a world that's defaulted in its glory and it's still kind of a beautiful place I've been a lot of places in this world and there's some really beautiful places in this world but they're not like they were intended to be so what do we see now we see Jesus now he's talking about the Lord who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of what? Death. Why? Because God cannot die. You know, I hope you get this. Y'all do should know God cannot die. What kind of a God would he be if you could kill him? He can't die. But he wanted to provide us with salvation. There had to be a perfect sacrifice. So he created the body in Mary's womb, put himself inside it, so he could experience death and yet he didn't die. The body died. But because he was in that body, he experienced the death. When they drove the nails through the hands of Jesus, God could feel it. When they put the spear in his side, God felt it. When they spit on him, when they put the crown of thorns on him, when they beat him on the back, God felt all of that. When they ridiculed him and mocked him, he felt all of it. And then for three days and three nights, the Bible says he went into the heart of the earth or the belly of the earth. That's where hell is, in case you didn't know. The Bible says hell's in the center of the earth. You know, I had a guy ask me one time, he said, Brother, you don't really believe that, do you? I said, yeah, I believe that. And he said, you believe that hell is in the center of the earth? I said, well, that's what the Bible says, so that's what I believe. He says, well, it can't be there. Get this. I said, why not? He says, because it's hot. Hello? What better place to put it? Yeah, it's hot there. It's molten. And the Bible says that hell keeps enlarging itself, so there's always room for one more. Wasn't it nice of God to make it that way? I mean, if you just determined to go to hell, hey, there'll be a place for you. You won't like it, but there'll be room. Of course, in the meantime... If you don't want to be a Christian and we find out you're a liar, we're not going to send you to hell. We're going to send you to Washington. <laughs> That's what we're going to do. Get you a one-way ticket. So we see Jesus. He, he was made like us so he could experience death. But he was crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, that's God's riches at Christ's expense, could taste death for every man, woman, child, whatever, generic term. What most people don't understand is that you can never, you can never pay for your sin. Doesn't matter who you are, saved or lost. Jesus died and paid the penalty for every single person. And he not only died and paid the penalty for your sin, 
He paid the penalty for the sin of the people who don't even want to go to heaven so they could die in their sin, but they can't die for their sin. They can't pay for it. They don't have what it takes. All they can do is surrender their life to hell. That's all they can do. And so you have to decide, are you going to trust Jesus? Now, if you trust Jesus, there is a side you need to know. He's going to change your life. If you really trust him, you're not going to be the same person you were. I was saved in 1971 in jail in Orange County, Southern California. I have never been the same person since that day. Before that, from the time I was 10 years old till I was 24 years old, I was in and out of jail all the time. I got arrested the first time for shoplifting when I was 10. When I was 13, I got arrested for burglary. There was always something in my life. And finally, I sat there in that jail cell and examined my life and realized that my life was totally worthless. I had stuff. I'd been already, by that time, married, had a child, had good jobs, bad jobs, worked in nightclubs, singer, you know. Then I spent most of my time drunk, just totally worthless, until I surrendered and said, Lord, change me or kill me. And he did. He killed me, resurrected me, a new person. Oh, I still look the same. I was still handsome. <laughs> But I wasn't the same on the inside anymore. And if you honestly, seriously give your life to Christ, he's going to make you into a different person. And after a while, people around you are going to look and say, you know, that guy doesn't, gal, whatever, doesn't act the same as they used to. Because that's what's going to change. Your attitudes, your desires, it's all going to change. Let me let you in on a secret. When I, before I got saved, I hated everybody. That's why I used to commit the crimes I committed. And so I just hated everybody. I was just, I was getting back at the world. And the one person I hated more than anybody was my dad. We had a lousy relationship. My mother left when I was nine years old. My dad was there, but that was it. You know, he didn't really do anything. He never played with us anymore. He never did anything. And uh, I hated him. I even got in a fist fight with him once when I was 16 years old because I was bigger than him by then. If he hadn't found a flashlight, I don't know where he got it from, I'd have probably beat him up, but he hit me on the head with a flashlight, and that was the first time in my life I ever saw stars. And I saw them. In the day, in November of 1971, when I committed my life to Christ, the next morning when I got up, I don't know how I knew it, but I just knew I didn't hate my dad anymore. My dad's still alive. He's 90 years old. Still doing good. And we don't have much of a relationship. I haven't even seen him in 30 years. I talked to him on the phone because he lives over in California and I'm always running somewhere else. But we talk. The best relationship we've ever had is on the telephone. But I love him. You know? I don't hate him anymore. I don't hate anybody. Of course, that was, that was a bad thing to say when you were in jail. <laughs> You don't want people to find out you don't hate anybody anymore, but they did. Father, we thank you for loving us. I do thank you for each one in this room. And Father, I've done what I'm supposed to do. I've shared the truth with them. If they don't listen, they don't pay attention, it's going to be their own fault. I don't know what else I could do to try to get them to commit their life to Christ. Maybe some of them will. Some of them already have, but maybe something in this sermon will help them see their need to become more obedient to you, which is a choice, so that you don't have to chastise them like you've done to me so many times to get my attention. We thank you for our Lord Jesus. We're so grateful that he was willing to pay the penalty for our sin and so glad that he rose from the dead because death couldn't hold God. And we thank you for that. We ask you to bless the remainder of this evening. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.